Top of the morning to you, church one. I think that it is uh, over 33 million Americans claim to have Irish heritage. Do you really? You did the search, the little, oh wow, yeah. Doesn't it seem wrong that Mike O'Donohue, our resident Irish teacher here at Church One, our lead teacher, is not up here? It's wrong, right? No, that's why you're taking the day off, Uh, typical Irish form, right? And I don't usually have a bunch of Irish jokes ready to roll out, but because today is officially St. Patrick's Day, I looked a couple up. Sean's having a hard time finding a parking space, so he says, Lard, I can't stand this. If you open up a space for me, I swear I'll give up Guinness, and I'll go to Mass every week. Suddenly the clouds part. The sun shines on an empty parking space. Without hesitation, Sean says, never mind, Lard, I found one. (laughs) It's a good one. All right, I'm not going to use my Irish accent through the whole talk today. Young man, says the judge, it's alcohol and alcohol alone that's responsible for your present sorry state. I'm glad to hear you say it, said Murphy, because everybody else says it's all my fault. (laughs) Karen says to his friend Mary, if you were stranded on a desert island, who would you most like to be stranded with? Mary says, my Uncle Mick. What's so special about him, Mary? He's got a boat. So to the Donahues, O'Rourke's, if there's any Kellys or O'Sullivan's here today, happy St. Patrick's Day. (laughs) And you're welcome. What is the cry of your heart this morning? When I say that, maybe something immediately comes to your mind. But it's a big question, so let's just consider it while we prepare to read Psalm 27. There are several things on David's mind when he reads, when he writes, excuse me, this psalm, this song. That's what psalms are. Bible teachers have argued about when he wrote it. Those who are part of the Jewish tradition believe it was a reflective psalm and David was older. While writing it, some think he was young, not yet a king. So we're going to read it. Uh, St. Augustine. Augustine, however you want to say it, said once that when reading scripture, he would try to picture the face of God because he said God is mysteriously present, living, and breathing in the Bible. And every contact with scripture is an opportunity for a God encounter that could change your life. So I'm going to read through Psalm 27. I know we've already done some of the verses, but I think it's important, so... If you guys could bring it up on the screen, I'll read it. We don't have it. There we go. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? It's the Lord who is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked advance against me to devour me, it's my enemies and my foes who will stumble and fall. Though an army besiege me, my heart will not fear. Though war break out against me, even then I'll be confident. One thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek, that I might might dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. For in the day of trouble, he will keep me safe. In his dwelling, he will hide me in the shelter of his sacred tent and set me high upon a rock. And then my head will be exalted above the enemies who surround me. At his sacred tent, I will sacrifice with shouts of joy. I will sing and make music to the Lord. Hear my voice when I call, Lord. Be merciful to me and answer me. My heart says of you, seek his face. Your face, Lord, I will seek. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my helper. Do not reject me or forsake me, God my Savior. Though my father and mother forsake me, the Lord will receive me. Teach me your way, Lord. Lead me in the straight path because of my oppressors. Do not turn me over to the desire of my foes, for false witnesses rise up against me, spouting malicious accusations. I remain confident of this. 
I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord, be strong, take heart, and wait for the Lord. Let's pray. Father, this is the day you've made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. It is better to have one day with you than a thousand days elsewhere. But we probably don't act like that. So help those words to be true. Help us to understand what they mean, to feel them at a deep, soulish level. May all we do here at Church One please you, Father, and bless you. In Jesus' name, amen. So there are lots of things in this psalm that David asks for. He asks for God to hear his voice. I was actually talking with a friend who does a lot of marriage counseling this week, and I just asked her, I said, what's one of the common denominators with couples who are having trouble? She said, not feeling heard and known and understood by their spouse. Not listened to. So David asked God to be merciful, to answer him, to teach him, to lead him in the way that he should go. And even though he does ask all of these things, I think it's interesting that then in verse 4 he says, there's only one thing I ask. That I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. So what is he asking for? To be with God forever, the one who loves him and protects him. To be with him in a place where he's at peace and where he feels safe and to be able to fully behold God for the rest of eternity. It's a beautiful picture. I grew up believing it was scary to be in the presence of God because the first thing that was going to happen when you stood face to face with God was judgment. Mm -hmm. Judgment Day. The day you give an accounting for a lifetime of sin. Now, if your imagination is anything like mine, you picture this process lasting a lot longer than just one day. So instead of thinking of meeting God and being with him as something to behold, it was for me something to fear. A day when you would be reminded of all your failures, when God pulls back the curtain and there's a huge TV screen with all your worst thoughts and deeds scrolling on a constant loop. And then sometimes he stops to use instant replay. All right, Lori, let's rewatch that and think about how you could have made a better decision. The idea of being in God's presence was kind of like when you were a kid getting told by your teacher you had to go to the principal's office and the whole way there you're going, what I do, what I do, what I do. Or maybe the annual employee review where you're just waiting for your boss to go over all those areas that you need to work on. This is not how David sees eternity with God. For him, it seems to be just the opposite. He sees God as a refuge and being in his presence as the only place he's really safe from harm and really truly known. He knows God and he's learned throughout his life that God can be trusted. And that's the difference between God and the rest of us. Well, it's one of the differences. Being totally trustworthy. There's a Lyle Lovett song called God Will. It's a country song about cheating. Go figure. So basically, his girlfriend has been running around on him. And here's part of the lyric. Who keeps on saying that he still wants you when you're through running around? And who keeps on loving you when you've been lying, saying things ain't what they seem? God does, but I don't. God will, but I won't. And that's the difference between God and me. David sees God as loving and faithful. He's got a different mindset. It's one that comes from spending time with him. And maybe that's how some of us can change our mindsets of who God is. So if you were to write that question in verse 4 of Psalm 27 as a fill-in-the-blank, it would probably be different. Might say something else. So remember how it starts. One thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek, that, that what? You don't have to say it out loud. That what? What are you asking of him today? Could you put it in one sentence? 
Again, we know David actually asks for a lot more than one thing. He wants to be heard. He wants God to be merciful, to answer him, to teach him, lead him. I think if we're honest about our big ask, it will reveal what the cry of our heart is. Father, I want, I want to know where my daughter is spiritually. Does she know you? I heard somebody say that within the last week. Father, show yourself to me. I can't find you. Father, I want to know that my life has meaning beyond just getting up and working and eating and sleeping. And David's one thing ask, I think, is interesting because it was future-oriented. And I think most of ours tend to be present. We're, we're so mindful of here, right? We're so mindful of here. Tim Keller, in his book on the Psalms, says of Psalm 27, I'm going to read this, David is having difficulties, but the beauty of God enables him to live in confident peace. If our hearts delight in God and his face, then we can contemplate losing earthly joys without fear. Even if our mothers and fathers forsake us, we can face it. If our greatest treasure, communion with the living God, is safe, of what can we be afraid? Yet we are afraid of so many things. He goes on. Our fears can serve an important purpose. They show us where we have really located our heart's treasure. Follow the pathway of the fear back into your heart, and then discover the things you love more than God. I often wonder if many of the things I dwell on, ruminate on, are just a form of sin, really. I said to Ed this week, in heaven, nobody's going to talk about money. They're not going to think about it. They're not going to talk about it. When you consider how much it's talked about on earth, won't that alone be a freedom? <laughs> just a freedom. When we rolled into 2019, I had some things, some goals for the new year. One, after turning my daughter's last tuition payment in, was to commit to getting all the rest of my dental work done. This is not an inexpensive or comfortable, easy reality. I confessed to my dentist a couple of months ago, outside of the well-being of my family, the thing I think about the most in life is my teeth. <laughs> I've had trauma with my teeth since I was a kid. You can feel very shamed about it, personally like you've done something wrong not to take care of them. And it can become such an overwhelming burden to keep having appointment after appointment, not cleanings, procedures, right? I call them dental events when I go. Years ago, I actually had one dentist who took a look at my x-rays, he sighed, and then he threw his arms around me, right? There wasn't anything unprofessional about it. And years later, it was just like four months ago, I made it a point to thank him for his compassion in that moment. It meant a lot to me. Maybe David was thinking about what it would be like just to have God's presence and no earthly pain. Now, he may not have been experiencing physical pain, but there's pain in rejection or in having enemies or feeling someone is saying things about you that aren't true, like he talks about in this psalm. My brother, Greg, is going into hospice care. He's not yet 65, and he has congestive heart failure, among other health issues, some he has lived with for years. And we talked on the phone earlier this week. He lives in Oregon. And he said, I'm just so tired of not feeling well. I'm so tired of living with constant pain. One thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. For in the day of trouble, he will keep me safe in his dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter of his sacred tent. David's troubles back then may have been different than ours are today, but the world's a scary place. It's, it's a lot of other things, too. It's wonderful. It's mysterious. It's but it often just feels unsafe. Even in churches, mosques, and synagogues, where you would think you would be safe, you are not always. And not only in these places has evil come from the outside in, it has come from the inside out, right? We've seen a lot of that over the years. 
I love the mental picture of God's sacred tent. In biblical times, there was a tent over a king's judgment seat, so when people would come before him, they would be invited into the tent. In the tabernacle, there was an inner sanctuary, the Holy of Holies, where God's presence appeared. Even in army encampments, there was a royal pavilion set up with posts and like a tent where you could be hidden, you could be invited in. God was David's refuge and rock. Being in God's sacred tent in his pavilion is to be in his most intimate confidence, perfectly secure, one of his hidden ones. You are invited. You are invited. I've always thought it was interesting how in our lives we look for safe places and people, but I'm not sure they exist. I've always wanted them to. I can remember when I was really young, I didn't like the game hide and seek. The places you'd hide never felt very safe because you were hiding alone, usually in the dark, and I always feared being forgotten, that no one would actually keep looking for me until I was found. I was the fourth child in the family. The movie Home Alone is based on the premise of a child forgotten, right? He was the fifth child, by the way. In the news this week, I read a story about a woman who got on a plane while in flight, remembered she left the baby at the airport. They turned the plane around. Oh my God. You know what I thought to myself right away? Fourth child. Maybe fifth. We want to feel safe, right? We want to know we can be ourselves, be fully known and loved and protected. Who says he'll forgive you? God does, but I don't. God will, but I won't, and that's the difference between God and me. I do think and hope we all have people in our lives who are trustworthy friends. I'm not trying to bash everyone. People are willing to look past our faults and love us anyway. But I've also heard people say, hey, I'm not Jesus. Like, what do you expect from me? Psalm 27 is a lament psalm. Mary Glavich, in her book on the Psalms, says they're the most common type in the Bible. There are over 40 of them. In them, an individual acknowledges their total dependence on God, complaining to him and declaring their trust in his help. These elements reflect Israel's history, which has been interpreted as an experience of cry and rescue, cry and rescue, cry and rescue, again and again. Most of these lament psalms take a U-turn at some point, and then they move over to praise and thanks. She goes on to say that through the laments, we can work through feelings of rage and frustration, and she actually encourages people to speak them loudly, if you're by yourself, uh, with a strong voice. Maybe shout them. Get that out. Mary recalls in her book the story of a woman who was captured and sold into sexual slavery. She was beaten, raped, and otherwise tortured repeatedly. And when a team from the International Justice Mission rescued her, they found she had written the first three verses of today's psalm, Psalm 27, on the wall in the room where she'd been held. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked advance against me to devour my flesh, my adversaries and foes, they shall stumble and fall. Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war rise up against me, yet I will be confident. It was interesting, after she was rescued and people heard her story, they wanted, wanted her to read those verses out loud. She wouldn't. She said, but I will read from Psalm 34. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. So maybe we need to think about what he has rescued us from and how he wants to deliver us from our fears. <sighs> I always say he rescues me from myself because without him to teach me, lead me, show mercy to me, hear me, all of the things David asked for, I would not get out of here alive. I would still be breathing and walking around, but I would not be fully alive. 
Maybe some of you have seen Rambo 2. Excuse me, Rambo First Blood 2. Take heart, there's a fifth one coming soon. But in Rambo 2, Sylvester Stallone as Rambo goes back to Vietnam on a rescue mission to free some American prisoners of war, many who are really sick, barely alive. And of course he gets them out because after all he is Rambo. But their prisons are these muddy bamboo huts, bugs, rodents, stench, not much relief from the elements, different than the prison some of us live in, right? Don't our fears hold us captive? Again, Tim Keller says, we are afraid of so many things, but if our greatest treasure would be like David's, communion with the living God, of what could we be afraid? David in Psalm 27 knows his only hope of being rescued from anything or anyone is God. For in the day of trouble, he will keep me safe in his dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter of his sacred tent. David knows he's not alone. We are not alone. We are not alone. I'm using songs a lot today because I love music, but also because it's a psalm. There's a song called Desperado. Desperado, you ain't getting no younger. Your pain and your hunger, they're driving you home. And freedom, oh freedom, well that's just some people talking. Your prison is walking through this world all alone. We can feel desperate, we all do from time to time, but we aren't desperados. Those without hope, and we don't need to walk through this world alone. We have a God who hears our cries and has mercy on us. Maybe this week we can spend time thinking about what we fear, what holds us captive and keeps us from freedom. And then we follow that pathway to our hearts like Keller suggests and find out what it is that we love more than God. David from a young age had a heart for God and a confidence in him. We were talking about this during our emotionally healthy spirituality class Thursday night actually. When David came up against Goliath, the well-known story in 1 Samuel 17, Goliath is offended. They're sending this young man, this boy, to fight him, and he says, come here, come here. He's got a big voice. And I'll give your flesh to the birds and the wild animals. David says, you come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. David knew he had this one before he even threw those stones. I've got this. David knew who he feared, and it wasn't Goliath. David had a sobering, holy fear of the Lord God, who he knew would protect him, who he knew loved him, and who he knew would be going into that moment with him, before him, behind him, above him, beside him, below him. He was not a perfect man, but in Acts 13.22, God says, I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. He will do everything I want him to do. I'm not sure a lot of us know what God wants us to do. I haven't figured it out yet. Mark 12, 30, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. The worship team is going to come back up. We're going to sing a song, and then I'll have a benediction for us. And just want to remind everyone that there is prayer after the service, if you'd like that. And if you just go out those doors, down the hall a little way, and take a left, there's a chapel where people are waiting and would like to pray with you. Let's pray while the worship team gets set up. Father, um, When I think of David and his confidence in his faith in you, I wonder where I've gone wrong. I want some of that. Build us up, strengthen us on our inside with your spirit today, that we would continue to find you, to look for you, to know you, to want to be with you, 
and to seek your face. In Jesus' name, amen.